Our guest today is Kim Callio. Kim is a pharmacist registered with the College of Pharmacists of British Columbia. She has a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of British Columbia, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Queen's University, and she is currently undergoing the certification program with the Institute of Functional Medicine. Welcome everyone to Friendly Pharmacy 5. My name is Lindsay Dixon. I'm a pharmacist here from British Columbia, Canada, and today I have a returning guest. Kim Callio is a pharmacist also from BC. Kim, I'm so excited that you've come back to join us today. Kim works as a pharmacist in, I think, a few different locations. Is that right, Kim? Yeah, she- I do Relief Pharmacy. Relief Pharmacy. But you do have pharmacy management experience, and you also have a special interest in functional medicine, and as do I, but you've actually had training in this area. And uh, functional medicine really looks more the root cause of, uh, of disease. Is that correct, Kim? Yeah, yeah, trying to get down to the to the very basic, like when did everything start with you, which of course is theoretically what a regular physician visit would do. But as we know, we have really limited time in those visits. So yeah, getting the full patient story, getting down to root causes and just recognizing that there's a lot of different causes for the same disease. So, so what we are going to talk about today, Kim, is something I'm really thrilled about. We participated in a conference uh, at the end of 2020 with the... The Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition. Yes, Um, that's right. And so, uh, and you you serve on a committee with this institute? Yeah, so I've been on their scientific planning committee for the last year. And what they do at that organization is education, mostly for practitioners so that we can get everybody on the same page as far as what therapies work. And then that way it disseminates down to the patient level instead of patients going directly to some blog and then finding a therapeutic nutrition uh, and doing it without the practitioner. And this conference was just excellent. And that's part of the reason that I brought you here today is it talked about uh, type two diabetes remission and that is something that is becoming more and more of a topic of conversation in the health sector. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, just the basics of diabetes, and then maybe we will uh, discuss a few of uh, the most recent studies and some of the evidence that we have out there for the, this new possibility. I think it's a little bit of a shift in thinking uh, rather than just treat the disease itself. Maybe we could reverse it eventually in some people. Definitely very new. We're on the cutting edge of things, but Mm -hmm. studies are coming out a lot more frequently now and showing really, really amazing results. So um, Mm -hmm. super excited to talk about this. So let's start off with talking about, first of all, what is diabetes? We know that there's type one diabetes and there's type two diabetes. Did you want to just go over a little bit of the differences? So type 1 diabetes has often been referred to as insulin-dependent diabetes. It was characteristically the one that you would get in your adolescence. It's an autoimmune condition, so it's not as much related to lifestyle as type 2 diabetes. Super tied to lifestyle. The insulin-dependent thing used to hold a lot more water before we kind of We see a lot more people with type 2 diabetes ending up on insulin now. So in type 1 diabetes, you don't make any insulin. And Mm -hmm. so people, before we discovered insulin, which was a huge Nobel Prize winning discovery, would just die. Yeah. So it was really, really awful. Now people can live really long, healthy lives with type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes... There's a combination of people don't make enough insulin and they also don't respond properly to insulin. So Mm -hmm. insulin when it gets released into the bloodstream is supposed to bring glucose into your muscles. It's supposed to go to your liver and tell your liver to stop making glucose. We've got enough. So your tissues don't respond adequately to that. So that's called insulin resistance. And then as a result, a lot of people will end up with a really high insulin level in the blood because the uh, body says, okay, 
give us more, give us more. We need to get rid of this glucose. Um, mm -hmm. And then over time, we see that the pancreas says, I just can't make any more. Mm -hmm. And so then at that point, we usually put people on to insulin. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it's two factors playing a role there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And type two diabetes has huge prevalence here in Canada and globally. There are a lot of people just walking around with type two diabetes and they don't even know it. It's quite a, quite a high percentage. And the implications of this on your overall health are quite far reaching. I was looking at a few stats today. Diabetes contributes to about 30% of, this is not, not managed, uncontrolled, maybe even undiagnosed diabetes, 30% of strokes, 40% of heart attacks, 50% of kidney failure requiring dialysis, and 70% of all non-traumatic leg and foot amputations. So obviously that, that is referring to type 1 and type 2, but it does have far-reaching effects on a lot of different parts of the body. And so that's why I think it's such a, such a relevant topic. Can you think of any other complications of, of diabetes? Depression. I don't know if you mentioned that there. No, I did not. Yeah. A lot of people who get diabetes all of a sudden are told that they have to really change their lifestyles and watch what they're eating. And because they've gotten to a stage where they've got such high insulin in their blood and it can be really, really hard to get people back into range without dramatic, dramatic changes. And it's, there seems to be a bit of a set point that gets set there, which makes it really hard for people to lose weight and keep weight off. So yeah, depression can be an issue because every time you go to the doctor, you're being told that you're not doing enough. And then every time you go to the pharmacy, you're being told, oh, well, I see your dose has increased, makes people feel like they've failed. But, mm -hmm. you know, really, by the time someone gets diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, we know that they've had this high insulin in their blood for quite some time, you know, years to decades. So they've already had a lot of the complications starting to happen like this cardiovascular disease risk, which are called the macrovascular complications mm -hmm. of diabetes. So yeah, it's really unfortunate for the patient. They show up and all of a sudden they're slapped with this diagnosis and told they have to make all these changes, but they're really starting from behind the eight ball and it's very, very difficult for them. And there seems to really be a lack of support in our healthcare system uh, for these patients because there's so much that you can do other than medication. And medication can help you. It can help get your levels back on target and that kind of thing. But to make this kind of drastic lifestyle change, there really needs to be support. There needs to be follow-up. And that's just something that, you know, doctors don't have time for this right now pharmacists don't really either there isn't really funding for this kind of thing right now yeah. right yeah, yeah I mean the the way that we treat even the way we treat diabetes type 2 really doesn't incentivize or motivate a patient to make those lifestyle changes because if you have levels of glucose when you first get diabetes that are high enough, you're going to get put on a medication anyway. So you probably get put on metformin right away, or even yeah. if your levels are high enough, you'll get insulin right away. And so that's mm -hmm. going to bring your levels down. We know that that's a band-aid solution. And then you'll get told as a patient, well, you might get a, you might lose a limb later, or you might have a heart attack or a stroke later, but these are all 10 years down the road. And so as a patient, you're like, well, you know, I got to go to work. I got my kids. I got this and that and the other thing. And this seems to be doing just fine for right now. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really incentivize the lifestyle stuff. Sometimes rather than sh make a huge lifestyle change, it's easier to just take a medication, see almost immediate results and just assume that everything is okay. And the cost of diabetes is huge for people. The cost of medication, the cost of different treatments. I'm just looking here. The estimated cost of blood sugar medications and supplies per year in Canada is $1,000 to $15,000 per year per person. Mm -hmm. And that's not even looking at the cost to the healthcare system, right? Or and private payers. Or private payers. That's right. The workforce, I'm really hoping that the funding model will change a little bit 
as employers are as recognizing they- that this is costing them a lot of money. Yes, I agree. I, I would anticipate they might move faster than actually public health because they're really looking at the nitty gritty. So what has been some of the more traditional approaches to treating type 2 diabetes? Usually we look at what we do. We give patients maybe three to six months to, depending on their levels, to make lifestyle changes. It really depends on the person. And then what I would usually see as metformin is often what people are started on. What do you see in your practice? Yeah, again, it depends on what their levels of of glucose are in the blood when they come in. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes they're so high that they they need to go on insulin right away. Um, Often I'm seeing high levels, but not so high that they need insulin. So they definitely get a metformin right, right away. And then some lifestyle counseling usually have a follow up, you know, one or two months later, see what their levels are looking like, and then go from there. But generally, the usual care progression is metformin to start, add another blood glucose lowering medication. And of course, there's a lot of interfighting between which medication is going to go on next, as different studies come out showing that there's cardiovascular benefit for this, that and the other thing. But you know, generally, add on medications until the point where these what are called oral antihyperglycemics are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And then eventually insulin uh, injections Mm -hmm. uh, from then on. Mm -hmm. And metformin for those people, for people who are not familiar with metformin, uh, what metformin does is it stops the liver from producing so much glucose, right? Or or pushing that into the, into the circulatory system. And it also helps reduce that insulin resistance that you were talking about, right? It causes the body to become more sensitive to that. It is quite effective. I have had patients that do have trouble with it at the beginning with, you know, gastrointestinal upset, that kind of thing. But usually most people are able to tolerate it. And it does remain one of the first line uh, medications for type two diabetes. Mm-hmm. It has been for a while. And one of the first medications that were used for diabetes that showed a cardiovascular benefit, um, mm-hmm. got some other effects as well that are really helpful. So <laughs> when we talk about these trials in a bit, you'll see that a lot of the investigators will keep metformin on just yeah. because it has so many other beneficial effects. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we've talked a little bit about the traditional approach to type two diabetes. So let's talk about what I'm a little bit more excited about are some of the maybe alternative strategies to approaching this disease. When we talk about diabetes remission, there are different definitions for that. And the studies that we will look at do discuss that. So what would, what would you define as maybe a general definition of diabetes remission? I know there's, there's a few different thoughts on that, right? Yeah. So there's a couple different ways of looking at it. Generally, we're looking at the reduction or elimination of glucose lowering medications. Mm -hmm. Um, And then without those medications, we see that the patient can maintain either, sometimes they're calling it a partial remission, so they're getting into blood glucose levels that would have been considered pre-diabetes levels, or full remission saying that they're getting into blood glucose levels that are below the diabetes threshold. So that's often what they're looking at is, are your levels below the threshold of diabetes diagnosis? And are you able to do that and maintain that without diabetic medications? There's a few differences there. Some studies are looking at it in terms of um, a time frame, because if you can do that for a day and then the study ends and you go back on all your meds, it's not really yeah. helpful. So some of them, like the direct trial was looking at two months of this blood glucose levels and the no meds. And then of course, some of the studies are looking at no meds with or without metformin. Mm -hmm. But it looks like the approaches that we're seeing so far, we are seeing results and we are seeing that, that these approaches can be effective. And even in usual care, what we just described with the medications 
we are seeing that some people are able to achieve remission mm -hmm. uh, just with the basic lifestyle coaching they get from their doctors. So that's about 0.5 to 2% of people are okay. able to do that. But these are highly motivated individuals. Yeah, I've had one patient that I remember that actually was able to do this. And I distinctly remember him coming in and he said, I did it. I've been off my medication for, you know, this long. And I didn't see him from the beginning. But what was very key, and this is very key to any approach, the key for him was the support of his wife. They completely changed how they ate. She changed how she cooked because she was cooking for him. And I think that's really vital. And that's that was shown in some of these studies, too, that you, if you can get the family involved or any kind of social supports, it, it, it really works. And it's possible. It's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. When we talk about type 2 diabetes and we want to talk about remission, what kind of options are there for people at this point in time, Kim? So the classic result that kind of gives us a lot of our guidance in designing trials and having things to compare it to was bariatric surgery. Yeah. It was kind of the original version. There has been some effectiveness of whole food plant-based diets, mm -hmm. um, very low calorie diets, low carb diets, uh, and of course the extreme version of that being a ketogenic, a ketogenic diet, and then fasting diets. There's lots of other ones that have been used, especially the DASH diet was used in hypertension. Mediterranean okay. diets are classically used in cardiovascular disease. And then of course, way back, not as trendy now is the low fat diet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So could you explain to us a little bit of what happened in the direct trial? Yeah, for sure. So that is some evidence for a very low calorie diet. So in very low calorie diets, there's low energy diets, and then there's very low calorie diets, and then there's total dietary replacement. Mm -hmm. um, those all have varying amounts of calories and varying amounts of real food versus like prepackaged items in order to meet those calorie restrictions. But generally we're looking at something below 1200 calories a day. They are by definition, a short term solution to help get somebody into range and then slowly reintroduce hopefully a, a healthier, more balanced diet so that they can maintain those results. So the direct trial was uh, a trial done with a, weight management program that was prepackaged called Counterweight Plus. And that was 825 calories to 853 calories a day. Not hugely low carbohydrate. 59% of that was carbohydrates in a day. 13% uh, okay. fat, 26% protein, and 2% fiber. So as far as compared to a plant-based diet, really quite low on the fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was for three months with then a structured food reintroduction uh, for two to eight weeks after that. So results from the direct trial, we saw that we had a 15 kilogram or greater weight loss mm -hmm. achieved in 24% of the intervention group as control to as compared to 0% of the control group. Wow. And then when they looked at diabetes remission at 12 months, so they've done the three month intervention, then they've done the food reintroduction, and then they're testing at one year to see whether these results were stable or not. So 46% of the intervention group got remission as compared to 4% of the control group. And it seemed to be that the amount of people when you stratified the people who achieved remission by how much weight they lost, the people who lost the most weight were the most likely to achieve remission. So that trial kind of pointed at, it didn't really point out a mechanism other than weight loss for mm -hmm. achieving remission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another option would be a plant-based diet. Now this wouldn't be for everyone, but it is something worth looking into and a lot of people are interested in going more plant-based right now anyways regardless of 
diabetes. So this was this is something that has been looked at as well in regards to type two diabetes. So what's what have been the findings on that? Yeah, so a healthful plant-based diet is the first word there is pretty key. Yes. Uh, we see a lot of people who go plant-based, whether that's for their health or that's for the environment, it seems to be a really nice correlation between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people end up just, they're not eating meat. And so they're eating anything other than meat and they don't have the habits in place to be consuming a lot of vegetables or a lot of fiber. And so they're eating, you know, kind of pre-processed lots of breads and crackers and that kind of stuff, oh. uh, or all those fake meats that have come out. And so there is a difference for sure between the healthful plant-based, which is, you know, a lot of legumes and veggies and lots of fiber versus this prepackaged version of the diet. But yeah, it's, these are great. They're in line with a lot of the guidelines that are out there. For example, American College of Cardiology, American Institute for Cancer Research. They're in line with the Canada Food Guide as well. They've seen some evidence for both prevention and treatment. So on the prevention side, we're looking into epi epidemiological studies. So, you know, they've looked at Seventh-day Adventist populations. Mm. That they stratify people based on how much vegetables they eat compared to people who are omnivores. The vegans had a 62% decreased risk compared to the omnivores. But then, as I say, when you look at the difference between a person who switches from an omnivore diet to plant-based, there was a different study in 2016 that showed that if you go to a healthy plant-based diet, you have a 34% reduced risk. But if you go to an unhealthy plant-based diet, you get a 16% uh, increased risk. Mm -hmm. So it really does matter what you're eating. And uh, plant-based diets, they, they also can be really helpful for lowering lipids, blood pressure, cardiovascular disease risk. Interestingly, they have been helpful for kidney disease as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the average person has the ability to make this change on their own or should they consult maybe like a dietitian or someone like you maybe? Because it would be quite dramatic. And I can see how people could go towards, you know, different processed foods quite, quite easily. And then there's an issue with B12 as well, right? If you yeah, there's lots of things that that require supplementation, not lots compared to I mean, really, a lot of people on the standard American diet need supplementation yes. um, by virtue of poor nutrition anyway. But a lot of those refined grains that people are used to eating are supplemented with B12. And then you get it, of course, from meat. So when you go to a, a plant-based diet, B12 is definitely something that needs to be supplemented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people can make these changes on their own, but you really need to be careful about people who are on medications. So if you're a healthy-ish 30 year old, you're not on any medications for your heart, for your blood pressure, for diabetes. Barring any other crazy complications that I haven't thought about, mm -hmm. go for it. Like, yeah. It's really not going to be a huge difference. You might want to talk to your pharmacist um, about supplementing with some omega 3s and some B12, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But if a person is on a bunch of medications that are assuming a certain set of conditions, high insulin, high glucose, high blood pressure, and then they go on one of these diets that can be very effective. We need to change those medications rapidly. And that's part of what the IPTN is trying to do is to educate practitioners so that they can educate their patients and start to have these conversations before someone goes to a blog, finds a diet and changes everything you know, and then falls over from low blood pressure.
Yeah, because these diets, like you're saying, they are so effective and they can have really, really quick results. Like we're talking within days, especially yeah. for someone who's on, like, like you said, blood pressure medication, insulin, you know, this, this does require a medical professional in cases like that, where you're on medications like that. It's not something that you want to be doing alone or making such dramatic changes yeah, there's one thing, you know, it's one thing to kind of add in a little bit of more vegetables or more fiber, yeah. but it's a whole other thing to totally change your diet. It'd yeah. be like if you left your heat on after the winter time, winter's gone, yeah. that condition is gone, you leave your heat on and now you're boiling in the summertime. Yeah. Conditions have changed. We need to change what our approach is. Make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And what about fasting? So fasting has been one of the approaches as well. What have we seen as far as fasting goes? Now there's different kinds of fasting as well. Mm -hmm. And I know fasting has been a very hot topic uh, over the last year or two, but I've never seen it yeah, specifically in regards to uh, type two diabetes. Yeah. So fasting has been quite the topic lately, especially amongst people who are interested in anti-aging, anti-cancer, all those sorts of things. There's a few different kinds. There's something called intermittent fasting that can mean a couple of different things. And as with a lot of different diseases or medical anything, we've got a bunch of overlapping terms for things um, yeah. as they get popular with, with people. So mm -hmm. intermittent fasting can mean, and classically it, it in what we're seeing, especially on social media, it, it means so you're fasting for a certain portion of the day, and then mm -hmm. you're eating your calories that you would normally eat during a shortened period. So you're giving your body a rest for usually about 16 hours in the day. It could also mean an alternate day fast. So it's so like a 24 hours without food and then eating normal and then a 24 hours without food. It could mean two week, two days a week. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit confusing. Periodic fasting would be three days or longer every wow. two or more weeks. So you don't want to do that very often, mm -hmm. but it has been, it has been used with some, some success. And then there's all these fancy things coming out, like fasting, mimicking diets where they're giving people total meal replacements and they're not actually fasting, but they're starting to see some of the benefits of them. So that's been another option that's come out relatively recently. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Have you ever done it? Have I you ever 24 hour fast last? Oh God, I'm dating myself. I said last year, but it's been a while. Yeah. When I was first researching fasting, I did do a 24 hour fast. Not as hard as I thought it was going to be, honestly. You get kind of used to not having food after a while. Going to sleep at night was a little bit difficult. Oh, yeah. You have the grumbly tummy. I see that. Um, so mm -hmm. I found that I had to lie on my stomach. But no, it was not that hard. Yeah, I think it's something you could work up to as well if you didn't want to do like full day. You know, you could start. I think sometimes people start at maybe 12 hours, then they work up to 16. And mm -hmm. uh, I've done the 16. It was quite easy. So I think it's something that's quite, it's quite attainable and we are seeing some benefits, but again, if you're on other medications, don't do this without consult, consulting with your healthcare provider, because it does have a, can have a major effect, right? So For talk sure. to your pharmacist or, or someone, <laughs> your physician, call Kim, <laughs> call oh, Kim yeah. before you have. <laughs> <laughs> my boss is gonna be like what are you doing on the phone all day you're supposed to be checking for, for uh accuracy of prescriptions <laughs> i'm just keeping people alive boss just keeping them alive it's yeah. okay well i mean common issue in people who start fasting is people who have gout so uh uric acid oh, goes yeah. out through the kidney and yeah. when you're fasting and same with if you're in ketosis, uric acid is going to compete with ketone bodies to get out. So <laughs> you're going to have a buildup of that uric acid and people have gout flares. Yeah, that's right. I had read about that. Thank you for mentioning that. That's true. Yeah. yeah I had a guy come in, he was rather confused. He's like, oh, I've been fasting. And that was an example. The IPTN, the whole point is to try to get people to talk to their patients before they go and try these diets. 
you know, right. every time you give out a diabetic medication or a chronic disease medication, just having that conversation with people and saying, Hey, if you're thinking about changing your diet before the next time you, you see me, give me a call. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an excellent point. I think it's a good mission for IPTN as well. The benefits, some of the metabolic benefits of fasting, I mean, they're quite wide range, right? Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the main, the main benefits of this approach? Yeah, so it, it can show really good effects on after meal insulin, insulin sensitivity. It seems to hit both sides of that type 2 diabetes issue, which is the, the beta cells in the pancreas not giving out enough insulin. So it can help with that. And then it also can make your other cells more sensitive to insulin, which is the other side of that coin. So it, it, it seems like it hits both parts. Fasting also seems to be helpful for keeping your mitochondria healthy. Mm. Um, What's a mitochondria? Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Yes. <laughs> but they're the powerhouse of the cell only if you balance your energy in and your energy out. You know, it's so funny. We're like, oh, it's a body. We don't have to worry about, I mean, I'm going to get nerdy here, but I was an engineer at one point. And so, you know, you study thermodynamics or you study any of those energy systems and you see like energy in, energy out. This is important. There's a balance. Otherwise we get things lost as heat. Otherwise we get problems. And then we kind of see the body and we're like, cheeseburgers? Cool. Let's do it. I haven't exercised in three days. It's fine. But it turns out when you look at the mitochondria's health, they're the powerhouse of the cell only if you balance energy in and energy out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they get sick, they dump, they dump energy in the form of heat, and we see some problems there. So fasting mm -hmm. seems to be able to restore the health of mitochondria. Wow. Yeah, I'm only asking because I also, I'm super curious about the mitochondria. <laughs> so whenever, whenever anyone brings it up, I'm like, oh, mitochondria, let's discuss this. So. Yeah, it was a really interesting talk uh, by Christine Doucette, who, who's out of Manitoba. She gave one of the talks at the conference. And, mm -hmm. and it, was, it was nice because as much as we talk about nutrition uh, yeah. and all the importance of that, we also have to talk about exercise. You can just change your nutrition. And yes, that's going to give you a lot of benefits. But there's more to a healthy body than just what you're putting in it. Well, and also if you are changing the nutrition and you add exercise, the benefits are so much greater, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, even just moving your body for 20 minutes a day, you know, it's our, we're made to move. It helps to circulate things. It helps to get, get everything going. Right. And so when we're talking about different approaches, we've touched a little bit on low carb and keto keto has been another kind of fad diet, but there are, there are some good results with, with keto that we've seen. Yeah. Would you, would you ever recommend keto to, to your patients? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I actually have experience seeing people with type two diabetes go through a ketogenic diet and, and find remission when I was working, when I first graduated, I was part of one of the studies we're going to talk to talk about actually. Oh, wow. I was a pharmacist on the ground there with that. Oh, wow. So yeah, I've definitely seen it be, be very effective. I get a little bit out of my wheelhouse when people decide to go on a ketogenic diet and they are not following a specific plan. They haven't mm -hmm. seen a dietitian because just like healthful, just like a plant-based diet, we know there can be an unhealthy version and a healthy version. Mm -hmm. And then of course the monitoring piece from a pharmacist perspective, a lot of people are on medications. We need to change those. In the study I was part of, we had protocols. We had Dr. Bayan. We knew what we were going to do with medications. We followed, we saw patients every week a little different compared to someone who says, Oh, I'm going to go on keto mm -hmm. with no plan. And I think that also brings to attention the importance of a multidisciplinary approach and public health 
generally, unless we, unless we're involved in a specific study, it's everyone's a little bit in their own silos, unless you have a certain partnership with, you know, a physician or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so when we're doing this, it would really be great if we could all communicate and work together in a way that was, you know, efficient. We don't really have that yet on a broad scale. It would be, I think it would be really beneficial for, for everyone involved to, to approach it that way. Because like you said, the pharmacist can help with medications, you know, the physician can keep an eye on all the different, you know, labs and, and that kind of thing. Dietitian could come and give more information. That would be, that would be really nice. <laughs> Maybe Wouldn't one. would be nice. Yeah. And there are, there are some studies in the works looking at trying to prove that an interdisciplinary team brace team based approach can maintain these benefits that we're seeing. So Kim, you were part of a study called the Farm TCR UBC clinical trial. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Mm hmm. <laughs> so that was a really cool study led by Dr. Jonathan Little. He works at UBC Okanagan. Really brilliant guy. And so in conjunction with the IPTN, with Sean McKelvey and, and that whole crew, they devised this study that, and the cool, the coolest part from my perspective as a pharmacist is that it was pharmacist led intervention, nutritional intervention. So patients would come into the pharmacy, they would have a medication review with a pharmacist. We would get Dr. Buy-in to change medications as appropriate. And they were put on the ideal protein weight loss system. So the great part about that is it's a full meal deal. You know exactly what the patient is going to be on as far as calories are concerned. Mm -hmm. It was quite low calorie, low fat and keto. And so the pharmacist would follow them every week. We would get to see the patient, which was very cool from a pharmacist perspective, you know, because usually they come in, they ask for their refills and then they buzz off for yeah. three months. But in this study, as they were losing weight and as they were in ketosis, we would monitor them every week in conjunction with a health coach. And the goal was to see whether we could get people to achieve uh, remission of their diabetes through this approach with the pharmacist led component in community care. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it's, it's neat that pharmacists were so directly involved in that. Cause I think that pharmacists, we're one of the most, we say underutilized, but also misunderstood professionals, right? There's so much that we can do. So the results from that were, what kind of results did you, did you see coming out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty amazing. And of course, let me preface this by saying like, I was involved in the trial as a on the ground level pharmacist yeah. in the community, but I was not like designing this trial. Don't want people to get confused. I was not a studier of this. No, but uh, you are, you are on the front lines, Kim. It's very important. <laughs> Yeah, so when they when they did the study, it was really, really cool. And, you know, anecdotally, I saw people who dropped like 80 pounds type of stuff. In and what kind of time frame? Whoa, like in a couple of months. Wow. So they had 99 people who were put on the intervention, the therapeutic nutrition, ideal protein intervention. They had 90 people given just treatment as usual. The intervention was less than 50 grams of carbs a day, about mm. 35 to 45 grams of fats a day, 110 to 120 grams of protein, uh, and the calories were between 850 and 1100 calories a day. And that was a combination of the ideal protein prepackaged stuff plus their own food as the study progresses. So the mm. way that the ideal protein works is you put someone on very much a hand holding prepackaged food diet for mm -hmm. one month. Okay. They eat a little bit of their own breakfast stuff and some snacks. And then 
as they gain the confidence, they get really, they get success really, really quickly. And then they get a lot of confidence and then they're much more able to adhere to the ketone ketosis diet with their own food. So that you gradually each month introduce more of their own food. So in that study, the pharmacist was responsible for safety. So they were responsible for creating a care plan that included what medications would get dropped and when, because we know that we see changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then monitoring the patient, as well as communicating with the doctor as needed. Mm -hmm. So the results of that study, so at three months, 35% of the intervention group were on no glucose lowering medications as compared to 0% in the treatment as usual group. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Really, really cool. The A1C levels, which is a three month average or trend of what your glucose was, they dropped 1.7% on average to below the diabetic threshold line. Mm -hmm. uh, fasting glucose down again below the diabetic threshold line. So we're seeing this, this remission definition mm -hmm. being met. 100% of the people eliminated their thiazolinidione medications. 61% eliminated insulin. 85% eliminated sulfonylureas, 92% got rid of SGLT2 inhibitors, 93% eliminated DPP4 inhibitors, and you see that 43% of people eliminated metformin. A lot of people still kept it on for other reasons. Mm -hmm. They definitely weren't fussy about getting people off of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then beyond the diabetic, just blood sugar changes, there was also a benefit on triglycerides, total cholesterol, LDL. So really, really great results. Mm -hmm. And were people able to keep this off? Do you think this is, maybe you don't have that data, but do you think this is sustainable for people generally? Because we do see dramatic results with other diets as well. But then we see that sometimes, you know, a year after, and we actually know the body has a mechanism where it wants to get back to that previous weight even. And that becomes mm -hmm. a bit a challenge, right? So what do you think, like, do you think this is sustainable? Or what supports do you think that people should have in order to, for this to be something that like, like your patient that you were speaking of that was able to just make such a drastic lifestyle change and, and keep it that way, right? Yeah. So the way that these things go a lot of the time is people will make these drastic changes. They'll do really, really well. And then they'll fall off the wagon, you know, at Christmas time, for example, we just had yeah. that. You have your big turkey dinner, you have your sweet potato pie, you have all of those things. You go out of ketosis and then the motivation to go back in can wane. Maybe you think, oh, it's fine. I don't need to be in ketosis. I'll just eat like lower carb. Well, then lower carb kind of like creeps up into high carb. And then mm -hmm. before you know it, you're back into hey. eating these glucose lowering medications. Anecdotally, I've definitely seen that happen. Even within this, this trial, there were some people that on follow-up have, have had to go back on this sort of diet again, but I think that there's a really great opportunity with these sorts of diets. They're kind of like an antibiotic for your metabolic health, you know, yeah. use them, you get people to see success, you get people their lives back, and then you, you need a, a constant follow up with them to keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's where so this, this trial was community based pharmacist led. There's another company in the States called Verda. And they did a study. It's they're in like year three and a half right now, where they did, they do continuous remote care 
of their diabetic patients. So, okay. they, you know, they give them all of these biomarkers that are connected to their remote monitoring center. And then they have health coach and, and doctor and, and nurse practitioner follow-ups a lot more frequently. And they're showing benefit, you know, out to three and a half years. At this point. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I really want to emphasize, we need to support the patient in this. If the patient has the support, we can, we can equip them with the information that they need, the tools that they need, they can do this and they become healthier. And yeah. the, cost, the cost of diabetes in Canada would be greatly reduced, actually, if we could invest more on the front end, right? And, yeah. and I mean, they get, they feel so much better. I mean, people in this study, they, they lost 13 kilograms on average of wow. weight. They yeah. lost 14 centimeters of waist circumference. Yeah. Um, body fat down 5% on average. So, you know, they, they really feel a lot better too. It's not all about weight, but people tend to feel better when they lose it. Yeah. And when they're taking off all of the, the processed foods and the constant influx of, of sugary foods and yeah, yeah, even, exactly. even the rates of infection, I'm sure over time would, would decrease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it affects your immune system. It just has, has such wide ranging effects. So you mentioned the Verda study. Let's talk about that study yeah, just sure. for a moment here. So that talked about the effectiveness and safety of a novel care model. So is that what you were speaking about? Yeah, so they, their patients are on a ketogenic diet. As compared, so the pharmacist-led farm TCR trial was uh, a specific diet, ideal protein that people were put on, and it was a three-month thing, and then follow up later. The Verda trial is an ongoing thing, so they're in year three and a half. Uh, I think they're doing a five-year trial is what they're hoping for. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to prove long-term sustainability of this approach. And they're using patient individualized ketogenic diets. So there's not much for meal replacement unless of course, you know, if the patient, maybe they want that kind of thing that they can find themselves, mm -hmm. but it's individualized. What foods do you like to eat? They've got a health coach that they talk to. And then there's a, so there's a diet component, but then there's also this continuous remote monitoring. So they've got, the patients have an app and they've got all of these biometric trackers. They've got ketone levels and glucose levels that they upload every day. And then there's this artificial intelligence platform that does some analysis and tells the physicians and the, and the nurse practitioners who they need to follow up with on that day. Cause like, oh, this person's getting out of range or all oh, these ketones are too high. What's going on? Are they sick? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a platform plus a nutrition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going on in the United States. Yeah. That's out of the United States. And it's shown really, really, really excellent results to the point where they're at, they had to stop looking at their control group and offer them all this intervention because it was unethical to keep going past two years. Wow. That's really significant. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of approach could ever happen here in Canada? I'm just thinking about the healthcare system in the U S versus here. Yeah. So Verda is a lot of it is private payer stuff. I think yeah. in our, because even in Canada, so in the States, you know, we like to think like, Oh, they don't have, they don't have public health care. They have all private health care, yada, yada, yada. But in Canada, this, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the medications that you get are paid for by your employer directly. So there is definitely in, an incentive from private companies to mm -hmm. look into something like Verda and get their people healthier. Because people who are healthier, not only are they not spending as much money money on medications but they also absenteeism and presenteeism drop mm -hmm. so you save a lot of money as an employer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well that's fantastic and then any adverse effects or safety issues i know we've touched on a few of a few of them but when we're when we're trying one of these diets or 
uh, making these changes that we should point out that maybe we haven't we haven't touched on? Yeah, so in these studies, they had pretty minimal safety issues. You know, most people, their acid-base physiology was normal. They're not seeing metabolic acidosis. Mm -hmm. They're not seeing much in terms of low blood. What we would be really concerned about is if people go super low on blood sugar, they mm -hmm. have a hypoglycemic event. And then the issues that follow from that in the pharmacy, in the pharmacist TCR trial in Canada, there were three mild hypoglycemic events. One of them, for example, was the endocrinologist didn't agree with the pharmacist changing the dose and then put the insulin dose back up and then the patient went hypo. Another example was a, a patient who wasn't very confident in the changing of medications, was afraid to lower them, and then got a hypoglycemic event. Mm -hmm. um, of course, all of the results from that study are unpublished, so they are not peer-reviewed yet, so okay. that needs Good to point. be taken into consideration. But a lot of the, hopefully with more education of practitioners, we can see a lot less adverse event events in in the community because we will be considering contraindications to these diets. Mm -hmm. um, so in a ketogenic diet, a lot of the contraindications that are the, the hard contraindications are metabolic issues. So people who have genetic predispositions to not metabolize things properly, like ketone bodies and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other potentials, you know, like a pregnant lady you might not want on a ketogenic diet, someone who has eating disorders you might not want on a ketogenic diet. There's a pretty huge list of potentials, so definitely people need to talk to their healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are other benefits to these diets other than just addressing type 2 diabetes, right? So we there are huge benefits, even in someone who's not diagnosed with type two diabetes. Obviously we all know that we should eat healthier. We should eat less mm -hmm. sugar. Right. But what does that do to our bodies? What have you seen, be it with fasting or a plant-based diet, ketogenic diet, some of the effects of these diets in our bodies, what have you seen? Or what would you tell someone who is maybe considering it? Yes. Yeah, so one of the biggest effects across the board is a reduction in inflammation um, yep. and oxidative stress. So for example, in a ketosis diet, the uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the ketone, the main circulating ketone, it actually acts as a signaling molecule, reducing oxidative stress and inflammation. We don't have much for data in humans, but in mouse models of longevity and lifespan, we're seeing that keto can show an improvement. And we are potentially seeing that there's, a, that there's a benefit in beta cell health because the, uh, the glucose and palmitate may, may play a role in reducing the beta cell death that can happen. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, you look at a plant-based diet, we're seeing like the high fiber can impart benefits on your microbiome. They're going to make a bunch of compounds in your gut that are really helpful and protective, that's going to reduce inflammation. The fasting seems to reduce inflammation and can help protect your cells from damage. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that it can, it can be a cancer preventative state from a fasting environment. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of effects outside of just diabetes, which speaks to, you know, what we kind of, you and I, tend to think and, and study with, with functional medicine, which is that it's all connected. Of course. You don't just have diabetes. Mm -hmm. The insulin levels that are high in your body aren't just affecting your blood sugar. And something I, I didn't, we didn't discuss this earlier on, but I wanted to just bring this to our viewers because I think it's something that people generally don't know is when we were discussing the differences between type one and type two diabetes, and we see type one as being autoimmune and it is you know, depletion of the body's ability to produce insulin. 
But in type two, we also see that there is a decrease in beta cell function and the beta cells in the pancreas are what are responsible for producing insulin. And when we, and when people go on these diets and the data that I saw was that it's kind of like the sooner, the better, but when they do, we see an increase in beta cell function. We see an increase in the, the body's ability to produce insulin. And then we also see a decrease in resistance. And we did discuss that a little bit, right? I think that often people think that type two diabetes has nothing to do with beta cell function. And that's not true. Yeah, you really do. You do need both parts of, of the issue in order to see type two diabetes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with and with these uh, different dietary approaches, we are seeing that that can be restored to to a point on a case by case basis, but it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely it's possible. And I think that there's data there that we sh we can't really ignore to show that preserving what's there is important too, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And this beta cell um, function improvement, this is all pretty new stuff. But it as as time goes on, I think, you know, people are really drawn to researching this type of stuff. It shows us a lot more hope than just researching a medication. And then also, just to comment a little bit on uh, cholesterol changes, because there is a concern with uh, the keto based diet, lots of people, uh, you go to these high quantities, I guess, of, of fats in the diet. And there have been some concerns about uh, lipids, cholesterol in the body when going on these diets. So what have we seen as results as far as cholesterol goes? So there is a concern because we're so used to looking at LDLC as a particle and being concerned with cardiovascular disease. People who go on keto diets commonly will get uh, a rise in LDLC. It's hard to tease out. I think we're going to get more information on this as time goes on, but there's a few things. So in the Verda study, for example, the comments they made on this were that, so first of all, epi epidemiologically, when you replace carbs with saturated fat in other studies that have been done, not necessarily that that's what's happening in this diet, but like when you look at that, they have seen that even with a higher LDL level, you're getting beneficial lipid changes overall. You're getting yeah. beneficial cardiovascular outcome data and mortality data. So whether the LDLC is a problem in the setting of a low carb or keto, or whether it's only an issue when you have a high carb environment or an overnutrition environment is to be determined. Um, they also noted that it's kind of expected you have um, a rise in the LDLC because there's less exchange of that molecule via cholesterol ester transfer protein. And when you're in ketosis, you're also mobilizing fat stores to yeah. create the ketone body. So you're going to get a mobilization of those cholesterol stores and what stems from that is a rise in LDL. They did note that the ApoB level was unchanged, suggesting that there's an overall neutral LDL associated cardiovascular risk. Hmm. So a lot of different factors there to consider. It seems like we don't need to be super worried about that high LDL, but more data could come out that changes mm -hmm. things. Yeah, and I think that just reinforces the importance of doing this with a healthcare professional, with some someone who is following following your case. And especially if you're someone who is on medications or has a more complex overall overall health issues or anything like that. Yeah, and a lot of people with diabetes who were on a statin medication who were in these types of studies just kept going with the statin medication. So yeah. those LDL levels could be addressed by increasing the statin. And just by virtue of having a statin there, you're reducing your risk overall, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for all of this, Kim. This has been very, very enlightening. 
Are you excited about this? Uh, what do you think the possibilities are here, even with pharmacists? How could we how could we help here? Yeah, I'm super super stoked about this. I think it's really great to see more information coming out, more conferences, more education for practitioners, because mm -hmm. the medical practitioners are really where patients are going to get the buy-in from. Mm -hmm. What I loved about the conference from IPTN is that we got data on a lot of different dietary approaches, and we're seeing mm -hmm. in the literature that there's a lot of different things that can work. So, you know, every patient is not the same. There's comorbidities that need to be addressed. Some things will respond better to different diets. So if you have diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, for example, maybe you want to do a plant-based diet because that's super effective for reducing inflammation levels. Overall, I think it's great. There's so much, there's so many more options coming out and it just feels a lot less doom and gloom now compared to when I first got out and started practicing. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, it, it's, it always saddens me when I see a patient come in and they look a little bit defeated after their doctor's appointment and they come in and mm -hmm. maybe they, they weren't expecting this. They say, Oh my goodness, I have type two diabetes. I guess I have to take this. And up until recently, we haven't really had too much to offer mm -hmm. other than medication. I think it's important for people to know that there are options. There are things that you can do to help improve your, your overall health. And you can speak with your pharmacist and you can ask your physician about different options. You can even ask for a referral to a dietitian. I think that you don't have to take on, a, you know, I'm, okay, I'm going to go keto. Maybe start one step at a time. Go and see a dietitian. It's, you know, it's covered by public health. Get a referral. Speak with your pharmacist. Ask about different options. If we don't ask questions, we're not going to get any answers, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kim. I know you have your own functional medicine practice going there as well. And we'll leave the link for people if they would like to consult with you or if they have any questions or anything like that. Was there anything else you wanted to, to add? I think we covered it off pretty well there. As you mentioned, I'm trying to call it functional pharmacy to avoid yeah. the word medicine. Okay. I'm not a doctor. So that means there are some things that I can't do for you. But yeah. as far as giving information and helping people navigate dietary changes and giving them information about who they need to talk to, what you need to say to your doctor, do you need to talk to a dietitian? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, I do functional pharmacy consultations. And then, of course, I have a, a blog and a website that I update semi-regularly when I'm not out in the woods hiking and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we will provide all of those links. And I think one of the great things that you can do with functional medicine as well is, and pharmacists do this just naturally, but I think functional medicine takes it a step further is just teaching people how to advocate for their own health, what steps they can take, yeah. right? Like just giving them this advocacy piece, go and ask for this, showing them what resources there are and, and what options. So I love the work that you're doing and uh, okay. go and talk to Kim, everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much, Lindsay, for having me. Thank you, Kim. All the best as you You've had a couple weeks off, but you're going to return to pharmacy land here pretty soon. So, yeah. so one, one day at a time, one day at a time. Okay. Thanks, Kim. All the best. Take care. Bye. Bye.